Um, like she said, I'm Lauren Alvarez. I love working with Erin. I just love helping parents and I love helping individuals and families because life is hard. And boy, when it comes to behavior, life is especially difficult. So I've been doing this for a while. I've been in parent education now. Oh my goodness, since 2005. So it's been a very long time that I've been in parent education. I also have been a school counselor now. I'm in my ninth year as a school counselor. I was an elementary teacher before that. And then I did parents as teachers where I did home visits with early childhood. And because I just, I guess I'm a nerd, I'm an LPC candidate too. So I went ahead and finished out that for school counseling and see families on the side, do parenting, do anger management um, with improving lives counseling services. And I love my job and jobs. And probably one of my biggest passions is just trying to help families and parents and kids find practical stuff that they can use that's really going to help them. And in the area of consequences, and what do I do for discipline? I feel like there's just a lot of confusion. It seems to be a very polarizing issue. There are some people who are hardcore, what kids today need is a good spanking. And then there's other people that can almost be too far over to, well, we need to connect to feelings. And my job is I want to give you information that's practical, um, that is effective, that is research-based, that has a combination of limits and communication. Um, because the goal of all of this in consequences is I want to keep the focus on my child's choice, on my teen's choice, on my young adult's choice. It's not me enforcing all the things. It's me focusing a spotlight on their choice and then allowing them to experience the consequence of that choice. And I grew up in a very, very strict household. My parents love me, but they pretty much the only tool in their toolbox was, you know, what was very much done in that generation. You're going to get a spanking or you're going to get really harsh punishment and definitely lots of yelling. Uh, talking about feelings, uh, I have no idea that they even knew what that was because no one, no one taught that. I mean, and so I just remember knowing a lot of things that I wanted to do. I remember when I became a parent, knowing a lot of things that I didn't want to do. But I was always second guessing myself, you know, oh, well, if I, if I have a consequence, is that going to like hurt their self-esteem? And, you know, I just I just was so confused because I knew the kind of consequences that I experienced also came along with a lot of negative emotions. Um, and my parents did the best that they knew how to do. But they came with a lot of negative emotional costs. Um, there came with a lot of cost to the relationship. In that I didn't go to my parents if I had a problem. Are you kidding me? I wasn't about to get in trouble. Um, so a lot of times when my parents really could have been a great resource because of the discipline system that we had in place, it did not motivate me to go to them when I had a problem for pretty much the primary reason was I didn't want the consequence that I knew was going to come with it. So very, very important for you to um, be thinking about that as we go tonight, because here's my job. My job is not to tell you everything that you're doing wrong. Nope, not my job at all. My job is to create more tools in your toolbox. No matter what tools you currently use and currently have in there, all of us could use improvement. That's another reason why I like teaching parenting classes because it constantly keeps me fresh. I am the mother of four. And so I have three sons from my first marriage. So I had to work through, you know, marriage, divorce, blended family, all those things. And those young men have grown up to be 21, 24, and 26 years old. And they are just blow me away. I did not have that kind of maturity when I was 21, 24, or 26 years old. As a matter of fact, I look at my 26-year-old and think, man, he's a little bit more like me at 40. But what helped him get there? I got out of his way. Oh, there were consequences and there were structures and there, but it wasn't about me controlling. It wasn't about me over directing and micromanaging. It was about me equipping them with the power of choice, but also equipping them with the power of consequences. You know, they didn't get to make all the choices, but I created as many opportunities for them to make choices. So they had practice failing. They had practice succeeding and they had practice with everything that went with that the consequences for the failures and the joys for the successes, because that is an amazing opportunity to let them learn. 
I had to learn how to do this because I didn't know how. This was not modeled for me. And I think for a lot of us, it wasn't modeled for a lot of us. And this came out of confusion and research and trying to figure out how can I be the best mom to my boys as possible? And one thing I will say is, and I also have a 12-year-old daughter. So she is, I'm right before, I've never had a preteen girl before, and I'm loving it. Is it perfect? Do people not make, of course, we have all of our issues and things like that, but I love it. I'm not scared of it. And I think one of those reasons is because we're well, having a little bit of experience, but also I'm not scared of consequences. I'm not scared of problems. I'm not scared of tough situations because I know that's where the learning happens. Um, so I want to give you as many practical tools. And I will say that my young, my young adult sons, they will, we have talked at length about a lot of these things, especially when they could compare how their friends' parents were communicating with them or the kind of consequences that their friends experienced in comparison to ours. And in their mind, at the end of the day, it made sense to them because I'm going to introduce this idea of logical consequences to you. A lot of you might have seen them, but I'm also going to introduce all sorts of extra things from parenting with love and logic, active parenting, practical parent education, um, lots of different things. So hopefully it will be helpful to you like it was helpful to me. Now, here's why we're doing what we're doing. This is from active parenting. The purpose of parenting is to protect and prepare our kids and teens to survive and thrive in whatever society they live in. So this is where I would love for you to send me something in the chat section. If you were to wave a magic wand and you were to say, oh, when my kid grows up, I want to make sure they have these skills when they walk out of that house. What skills do you think they're going to need to survive and thrive in this democratic society that we live in? So tell me, what do you think kids need to be thriving adults without you constantly having to hold their hand? What skills do you want them to walk away with? Send me some messages over in the chat section. All right, let's see what we got. Communication. Oh, my goodness. We could definitely all use some communication skills. How to handle conflict. Very much so. A lot of times we either avoid it or we create it or we overreact to it. So many different things um, there. Uh, let's see if we have anything else. Um, so continue to send those to me if you have any um, additional things. What skills do you want them to walk away with? Uh, resiliency. Well, you know what? You can't be resilient unless you've had struggle. Resiliency is the ability to bounce back from hardship. So we have a lot of very loving, very kind parents who rescue their kids from consequences because, well, they're just kids and, you know, it, it, I don't want to hurt their feelings or they have really masterful children who know how to really guilt you or, or talk you out of the consequences. And the thing is, is when we rescue them from the struggle of their choices, then we also rescue them from the chance to build resiliency with the best intentions, with the best intentions, self-confidence, the ability to stand up and do this and believe that I can do this. You know where you get self-confidence? From having had experience with successes or experience with failures that then can turn into learning opportunities that then you can apply those principles. And here's the thing you have to know about parenting. I know, and, and I've dealt with all sorts of different parents. I've even taught parenting classes in the jail. Really at the core, most parents, 99% of parents, they really do want their children to do better than they did. They really do want their children to grow up and have successful lives. I know we hear all sorts of other stories about, you know, a lot of the real tragedy and trauma that occurs within families. But I just know there's so many parents out there that they want their children to do better, but they have no idea what they're doing. So they're using some very ineffective and actually counterproductive parenting skills because they just don't know what they don't know. Just because your kids are getting older from year to year does not mean that they're becoming responsible. Just because your child is going from a five-year-old to a 10-year-old to a 15-year-old does not automatically develop communication skills, conflict resolution skills, resiliency, and self-confidence. It doesn't automatically happen with age. How those things are developed are through whether or not the environment that they're growing up in is facilitating communication skills, 
responsibility, uh, how to resolve conflict, because we're modeling that and creating opportunities, how to learn that, how to follow through and do what they say they're going to do. Well, if they have some chores or they have some things that they're responsible for, and if they don't do that and they have consequences, that's teaching those skills. And so here's what I'm hoping that your takeaway from this will be. I know what you hope for your kids. It's not going to automatically happen. It's our day in and day out parenting decisions that create an environment that that can happen. Now, of course, there's all sorts of other variables that can come in and, you know, get in the way of our kids reaching their goals. You know, we don't have control of all of this. And some of these things are really sad tragedies. And some of these things are really difficult life choices. And there's all sorts of different influences, but I really want to encourage you, your day in and day out parenting decisions, they make a difference. And we're going to mess up, but our patterns over time are either creating environments that develop resiliency, communication skills, conflict resolution skills, responsibility, uh, cooperation, problem solving, or with the best intentions, kind of getting in the way of that. So um, so my hope is that you kind of remain open for that because to build responsibility, um, we love our children enough, enough to let them experience the consequences of their choices. That's what actually prepares them for adulthood. Making everything easy for them, a parenting style called lawnmower parenting style, where we go out in front of them and, you know, run through all of the possible barriers. Well, no one in my adult life is running through the possible barriers for me. And man, you know, there's a lot, there's a lot of decisions that we have to make and a lot of struggles that we go through and no one's coming in and holding my hand. If we are constantly making everything easy for our kids because we love them and, and we're trying, to, we're doing the best we know how, we're actually getting in the way of them building responsibility. Now, a lot about this also ties to brain development. And I'm so thankful. I mean, actually, I don't, I don't remember even being introduced to any of these things till about 10 years ago of um, all the deep, rich brain development things. It was really more like 11 or 12 years ago. Uh, but now there's all sorts of books. I'm going to actually put some in the chat section. Um, any um, Dan Siegel books um, or the whole brained um, child. Um, though any of Dan Siegel's books are fantastic because he takes these really complicated neuroscience um, information and he likes to translate it that into how can I teach parents about this and make their parenting more effective. But the way that our brain develops, it develops from back to forward. So we've got our brainstem and our amygdala, amygdala right here towards the back here. That's our fight or flight. You know, that's, you know, well-developed even in a baby. They're kind of born, that's ready to go. And then all these other parts, you know, the nucleus, the amnons, the cerebellum, all those things are developing. The very last part of the brain to develop to where it's working smoothly like it should is the prefrontal cortex, the thinking brain, the thing that makes everything work. Well, what does the prefrontal cortex do? It's responsible for sound decision making. Make, you know, when we ask our kids, what'd you do that for? I don't know. They literally aren't thinking. And their brain isn't really efficient. It's not really well designed enough to make good decisions. Typically, they're learning how to make a good decision after they've made a bad decision. Empathy, being able to realize how their behavior impacts other people and how other people are feeling. Considering consequences, they don't think about the cost of what they're doing to themselves or to others. Regulating emotions, those huge ups and downs and overreactions and everything that we thoroughly love about parenting. Um, that is part of the prefrontal cortex's job to kind of manage the amygdala and manage the midbrain so it doesn't take over and we just act on impulse um, or feel on impulse. And also self-awareness, you know, awareness of the volume of their voice, their body in space, you know, all sorts of different things. And morality, deciding what's right and what's wrong. A lot of times, the younger the child, morality is basically, what can I get away with? If I don't get in trouble, then it's still good. You know, if I have to go whack someone on the head to go get that truck that I want to play with and it works for me, tomorrow I'm going to go whack someone on the head to get that truck. Now, if I go whack someone on the head to get that truck that I really want to play with, but now I have a consequence, well then, huh, 
well, I still got what I wanted. I got the truck, but I didn't really like this consequence. We have to create those opportunities for them to stop and slow down enough while their brains are still developing before they act on impulse. Now, one thing does happen as children get over, brain development really does create the opportunity for the prefrontal cortex and higher level thinking and all those kinds of things to be available. But it doesn't, if we don't provide that effective communication, kind of like the influencing and the pressure to stay within the limits, um, that it doesn't always connect all the dots. Our parenting helps connect the dots for all of these things. So, I mean, that's one thing I love about being an elementary school counselor. I can see some of those kids that come in in pre-K and you're like, oh my goodness, I'm glad I'm not their pre-K teacher. And then I see them in second grade and third grade and fourth grade, and they're totally different kids through a combination of effective supports, limits, and brain development to where they actually start to figure things out. Our kids need your help. Your parenting style really influences a lot of this. So we've got our dictator parents. Everything's about the rules. We've got our doormat parents. Everything is like, you know, maybe there's not a lot of structure. There's not a lot of follow through. We're really wishy-washy. We might say we're going to do something and then, you know, we're just overwhelmed. And then there's an active parent where they use the combination of limits and choices within those limits. But that's what that zigzag line is. You know, dictators, there is no choice. Doormats, it's all choice. Active parents, a combination of both. And really the goal is there should be freedom within expanding limits. As your child gets older and develops the you know, responsibility to make better choices, ideally they should be making more and more and more of their own choices. Here's what often happens. We start off in reverse. We give our toddlers and let them have all choice and rule the roost and our elementary kids, we give into their tantrums and their fits and this and that. Then they become teenagers <gasps> and we're scared. And now they have no choice. Well, that is not an environment for success either. By the time my sons were older and they were in high school, I knew where they were. We had our guidelines for cell phone usage and, you know, out of bounds behavior, but they were in charge of their schedules. They were, they had flexibility. They worked jobs, you know, they managed money and they were so much better prepared for going off and living on their own than I ever was. I mean, I was raised in a house where there were tons of rules. Absolutely. Well, what happens when there's no one there? What happens when there's no rule enforcer? Hmm. Sometimes you don't make good choices if you've never had the chance to make choices. So does the dictator parent love their child? Absolutely. Adores them. In their mind, I'm keeping them safe. Does the doormat parent love their child? Absolutely. Now, in cases of neglect, you know, that's a little bit of a different story, but for a lot of us, when we're too lenient and too flexible, we love our kids. How can we be the most effective? I've got to have rules, but I also have freedom. I also have to have choice. And they should have more choice as they get older. Because what would we like? It'd be kind of nice if our kids would do everything we said with the yes, mommy, yes, father, with joy. Or could we have Chick-fil-A children? It is my pleasure to serve. Wouldn't that be amazing? Well, <laughs> there's only one Chick-fil-A, all right? As you notice, the rest of the fast food industry is no Chick-fil-A, all right? Now, here's the deal. We will never have complete control, ever. We would like to sometimes, but let's think about this. If the purpose of parenting is to protect and prepare our children to survive and thrive in the environment they live in, well, is anyone in their adult environment going to be 100% controlling them? Nope. If they have learned how to be successful in a super controlled environment, well, what happens when that control is removed? Oh my gosh. You know, they don't think about consequences. They've never even had the practice of making choices. And so often in this lust for freedom, they will make pretty significantly negative choices, but now you're a grown up, and there's a much bigger cost. A fifth grader has a lot less consequences than a 25-year-old. So, so really, while we might think we want control, really all we actually have is influence. Now, the influence piece, that, that can be a very limited influence or that can be up to 100% influence. That depends on the discipline and communication structures we have in place. Because, you know, there's always a sprinkling of other variables in there. But what I can say is with my children, only because I learned 
things and made mistakes and learned and made mistakes and learned and made mistakes and learned. I was able to parent them out of the strength of our relationship um, to where they could hear me because I had deeply invested in the relationship while at the same time setting limits. And, you know, my bent, because I was grown up in such a strict house, so my bent was to be a little bit more lenient. So I had to catch myself knowing that, hey, I'm not doing them any favors if I am making things too easy for them, if I'm doing things on a regular basis that they can do for themselves. So I've continued to have to adjust and grow. Um, but what we have is influence. And that's one thing I like about the kind of consequences we're going to talk about is it actually really keeps that relationship intact or increases the chances of keeping that relationship intact. Now, there is a different class that I've taught and stuff like that, effective communication, but this is a super fast summary of what that is. Basically, there are ways that we talk as parents where we really are trying to, you know, do our thing that actually get in the way of communication. If I'm commanding, you're going to go up there and you're going to do this right now. Well, yeah, I'm solving a problem, but that's not communication. That's very one-sided sarcasm. You know, we're constantly making a joke about what they're going through. Being a know-it-all, criticizing, interrogating, negative expectations, moralizing, perfectionism, focusing on mistakes, placating, distracting. These are all ways that parents will communicate with their children that actually shut down the conversation, that remove our chance of being an influence. So communication, you can have the best consequences in the world without good communication, you kind of get in the way. What Parenting with Love and Logic calls it is fighting words versus thinking words. So let me, um, with that in mind, let me pull those up. i give you an example of fighting words versus thinking words. Hold on over here. Da, 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 da. Okay. Sometimes how you say it makes all the difference in the world. Let me make sure. Yep, you can see it. So I'm a big fan of Parenting with Love and Logic. It actually gave me the phrases to say when I was second guessing myself. The only way I was used to being talked to was, Born, get over here and do this now. My parents were very much in charge. I crack up with my future, with my bosses because I call it, I have authority trauma. So one time my principal at my school left a post it note on my door and it said, Lauren, I need to talk to you. I am a grown woman who is really good at her job. I was in a panic. Because all that reminded me, I felt like I was back in third grade, Lauren, I need to talk to you. And it was my dad. So I'm like, oh my gosh, what did he do wrong? You know, <laughs> so, you know, and she wasn't down in our office. And it was like an hour later that I found her, you know, as I was off doing other things. And I'm like, what is it you wanted to talk to me about? She goes, oh, and it was something so simple. It was some like parent communication, something, something, nothing that was an issue. It was just something she needed my help with. And I went, oh my goodness. You can't do that to me. You can't leave a note on my door. I have authority trauma because of how I was talked to as a kid. Now, I am so thankful that my parents were in charge, but they were scary in charge. So from then on, anytime she needs to leave a note on my door, she said, Lauren, I need to talk to you. You're not in trouble. <laughs> it was our, our ongoing joke about that. But a lot of it was not what was said, but how it was said. So what I like about Parenting with Love and Logic is it gave me phrases and words that I could use. So fighting words are kind of when we pick a fight with our words. Think about this. If a coworker or your boss talk to you this way, you get to work on that lawn right now. Well, yeah, they're your boss. Would you want to get to work on that lawn right now? Oh, no. Um, you're not going to talk to me that way. I'm not letting you out of this house until you clean your room. If I had a coworker, or a partner, or a boss that talked to me that way, it might work occasionally, but inside, I would be so full of resentment, and I'd be looking for another partner. I'd be looking for another job. Now, instead, hey, feel free to join us for your next meal as soon as the lawn gets mowed. I'm glad to read you a story as soon as you finish your bath. You may eat what is served, or you may wait till the next meal if you like that better. If I'm talked to that way, there is choice completely saturating those conversations and it's not about the control now guess what if they don't mow the lawn then sorry we're not you know i'll serve you dinner when the lawn is mowed if they don't finish um their bath then we don't get a story you know some of these are just built-in consequences fighting words would say no you can't play outside until you practice your lessons thinking words would say yes you can play outside as soon as you practice your lessons 
In Parenting with Love and Logic, they call it, let your yes be yes and your no be yes too. Meaning I can still say yes with conditions. No, you can't watch television until your chores are done. Here's how I could let my yes, let my no be yes too. Yes, you may watch television as soon as your chores are done. How you say it makes all the difference in the world. You do not have to be bossy, commanding to be in charge. You can actually be polite, but follow through and you are still in charge. Now, what if they don't get their chores done? No television, automatic consequence. What if they don't finish their lessons? Sorry, we're not playing outside till we, you know, you may play outside as soon as you do this. Um, these are the way you say it is huge. Because you know what? A lot of times we don't realize how disrespectful our communication is. And I know there's a lot of different polarizing conversations out there about, oh my gosh, kids are so sensitive and oh this and oh that. I can still be in charge and be polite. I call it my teacher voice. I don't have to yell for my children to listen to me. I don't have to yell. As soon as I yell, I've actually lost respect and lost control and lost cooperation. I've actually just made my job a little harder because then I've got to work harder and expend more energy to get them to do what I need them to do. Now, if I say something like in Parenting with Love and Logic, they say, let your words be gold. If I say, we will eat as soon as you're seated. I will be glad to listen to you as soon as your brother has finished talking to me. If we do what we say and we simply follow through with what we say we're going to do, hey, we're leaving in five minutes. You can leave full or you can leave hungry, you know, and then follow through. When they know that you mean what you say, they're going to listen the first time. When you repeat yourself five or six or seven or eight times till you get to the point where you're so frustrated, you raise your voice. We've actually, without thinking about it, we've trained them to not listen. Because they know, hey, I don't have to listen because nothing's going to happen until mom's voice raises. Well, then she's probably going to get mad enough to do something about it. So, oh, I'm going to comply right now. I've trained, now if I say it, and then I'm a big one, I'm res expecting a response. What do we say? Yes, mommy. If I say it with a response and they don't do it, automatic consequence. There's no arguing. There's no re-explaining. Okay. I'm just going to follow through on what I said. So um, can be very, very powerful things. So now, of course, nothing is super easy. You know, kids are going to find every kind of loophole known to mankind. Um, that's their job. You know, they do their job very well. But just realize that sometimes how you're saying it makes all the difference in the world. Because really, if I want to build responsibility, I want kids who can accept their obligations. I want kids who learn how to do the right thing as the situation calls for it. And I want kids who accept um, accountability for their actions. The only way I can develop that kind of responsibility is through a combination of choices and consequences. It's not all choice. It's not all consequence. It's a combination of both. So that is the long-term goal. And the other thing is this absolutely does not happen overnight. You're going to go through seasons. Some seasons are downright exhausting. Exhausting. Early childhood, exhausting. Uh, teenage years can be exhausting. Sometimes it can actually be pretty cool. I was really surprised. Um, I found early childhood to be much more exhausting than the teenage years for me. And we had some very significant things that happened in the teen years, but maybe it's just the fact that they get heat up food in the microwave that made life so lovely. But um, even with little ones, giving them the opportunity to experience the consequences of their choices. They're throwing the toys at you, toys get put away. You know, there's so many different things that you can do and so many preventive things that you can do. We can actually have some structure in our home and we can have routine bedtimes and we can have clearly communicated expectations. And that prevents a lot of madness. You know, if kids are, uh, we're so frustrated with our kids and their cell phones, well, let's have a cell phone contract where it's you lit, sit down and you can just Google cell phone contact for contract for parents and children. And it literally lays out the expectations. Um, you will, you know, your passwords will be known by your parents. Your, your phone will be checked regularly. We will not use our phone to communicate in a disrespectful or bullying way. We will not have our phone with us at the dinner table. We, you know, it goes through the expectations. Parents have expectations that are in obligations on their own. And then both people sign it. Well, if they don't follow the expectation, that they've already agreed to, well, then it makes sense when the phone's not taken away, when the phone is taken away. So 
There's all sorts of things that we can do. All right, now moving on with this idea of developing consequences. This sounds great, Lauren. What about punishment by hurting? Now, I love, um, you know, Dr. Sorrells, Dr. Barbara Sorrells. I'm actually going to put her name in here. If anybody um, needs to find the most amazing expert of all things, I'm her biggest fangirl. Dr. Barbara Sorrells, she's actually located here in town. So if you Google her, um, so our E-L-L-S, I think, yeah. If you Google her, she's a huge, um, so well-educated, 40 years in education, but specifically focusing on early childhood and trauma and how to counteract the, the brain and behavioral effects of trauma. She is so amazing. And she calls, you know, when we were in there, she was talking about, we've got this paradigm that kids behave because they want to drive us crazy. They misbehave and all these different things that she had us kind of go through. And she said, you know what, children behave well when they can, when they know what to do. And to try to make children do good by making them feel bad, it's not a long-term solution. Um, and that's a lot of times what our established discipline techniques are. Discipline is to come alongside and teach. I'm going to come alongside you and teach you how to do this. If you don't follow my instructions, there could be some consequences to kind of keep you in this area, but I don't just expect you to know how to do it. I show you and I show you over and over and over again. And I, once I've established this, I hold you responsible and responsible and responsible over and over again. I don't have to make someone suffer to teach them. But, you know, why is it popular? Well, here's why it's popular. Sometimes punishment by hurting, whether that be spanking or whether that be the verbal, you know, the yelling and the screaming, it often works in the short run. Nobody wants to hurt. I want to get out of that situation as quickly as possible. It's what we learn to do, you know, and, and you know, a lot of people say, well, this was done to me and I turned out okay. Yeah, this was done to me and me, Lauren, I did turn out okay, but it took me some decades to get over some of those impacts, some of the emotional costs to that, but it's what we learn to do. And sometimes if we're trying to do something different, there's nothing more fun than all everyone around you second guessing everything that you do. Now, why does it backfire? It leads to resentment and retaliation. If my number one goal as a parent is to overpower and control and hurt, meaning like I'm going to make it very uncomfortable for them to disobey, it leads to resentment and retaliation. I can testify to that. Lots of resentment and retaliation. And those are some of the things that I had to work through. And also just realize, hey, my parents did the best they knew how to do with the tools in their toolbox. I couldn't have said that 20 years ago as I was dripping with resentment and retaliation. Guess what? We're going to find ways to get back at you if you make our life miserable. And sometimes the weirdest thing that teenagers will do is they'll get back at you and wind up hurting themselves in the process. Oh, well, I'll show them. And they go participate in all sorts of risky behavior. And, you know, it leads to sneaking, blaming, and excuse making. So let's think about this. If me, the child, actually admits to doing something, and on the other side of admitting to doing that thing are super harsh consequences, over the top, you know, consequences or physical punishment, just from sheer self-preservation, I'm not going to own up to anything. I'm going to sneak. I'm going to blame. I'm going to make excuses. Oh my gosh. You know what my brother and sister and I were? They were the best little liars ever. Because, oh, spanking was it. I mean, that was the number one go-to. Well, I really didn't like my bottom hurting. So guess what? If I can blame my sister, if I can blame my brother, if I can sweet talk my way out of man, we got all sorts of manipulation skills that were very well developed just for self-preservation. You're like, well, I don't want that ridiculously harsh. Comp I was the best liar of all time, right down to the path where I'd say, all right, I'm headed to work because my parents didn't take me to work and I would go to work. No, I wouldn't. I would go to party and they had no idea. Uh, you know, dad would say, well, you can't go to the basketball game. It's a weeknight. So I'd say I was going to work and I'd go to the basketball game and he would be none the wiser, you know, because it became so ridiculous, like the, the weird random rules that we just found our way around the rules and made it work for us, which wasn't really good for developing character. So think about that. Is there even any incentive for your kids to tell the truth? You know, um, and then it can undermine the relationship. That's that tricky piece. And that, I think, was the thing I was so surprised about. You know, pretty much most of what I heard is you have to control your kids. And you have to control your teenagers. I didn't have to control them. I had to let them experience 
the consequences of their choices. And I created those consequences often, um, but I didn't have to rub their noses in it. I didn't have to make it super painful. Just like as an adult, my consequences, they don't have to be super painful for me to adjust and grow. Um, so just think about that. Because discipline, it should be respectful. I'm going to talk to my kids and behave towards my kids in a way they would like. I would like them to talk to me. It should allow for the child to participate, fit the situation, and be firm but not harsh. So what does that look like? So basic starting off discipline methods that coming alongside and teaching. Let me check how I'm doing on time. Oh, good, Erin. I'm making good time. Um, is polite requests, I messages, and firm reminders are great starters. So let's let's think about this. If I'm going to discipline my children, which is come alongside to help. Now, discipline does not mean there's no discomfort, but my goal is not pain. For example, a soccer coach, my sons and daughter all play soccer. So that coach loves them enough to physically train them. Do kids like training and running and lifting weights and exercising when they could be sitting down? Not necessarily. So there's some discomfort in there, but it's not, I'm going to make you run till you throw up. Doesn't have to be that way. So, um, but in this, this discipline, polite requests are a really great place to start. Please clean up this mess. Now, if I say clean up this mess now, do I invite participation? I've actually probably created a little bit of a power struggle, a little bit of a pushback, a little bit of, Ooh, my child's keeping score and they're going to find a way to score against me as soon as they get the chance. I do not lose any authority by being polite. Now, I don't have to say, please clean up this mess, sweetie, pooty woody. I don't have to be like a pushover when I say that, but please clean up this mess. It's polite. It's respectful. Now, what if that doesn't work? Which, the younger the child is, the less likely it is to work right away. You know, young children, just for the sheer sake of their brain, um, need more reminders than older children. Then we can move to an I message. I use I messages to, I messages every single day with my partner, with my students at school, with my daughter. I use them constantly. They are very clear. They are respectful, but assertive. And they actually clearly communicate needs and expectations. So when I message, the formula is I have a problem with, I feel because I would like you to. So here's what that might sound like. I have a problem with the mess in the family room. I feel taken advantage of because I have to clean up the mess you made. I would like you to take your dishes to the kitchen. Will you do that? When will you do that? Getting that verbal follow through is really powerful because if you just say that when you're walking by and they're playing a video game, there's no guarantee they heard you. And they'll say, I didn't hear you. Well, when you say, will you do that? When can you do that? That creates a verbal commitment. It's not, will you do that? When? You know, watch your tone. Um, very clearly communicate. I have a problem with the mess in the family room. I feel taken advantage of because I have to clean up the mess you made. I would like you to take your dishes to the kitchen. Now let's think back to this little brain slide. All right, I'm gonna scooch us back here to the brain slide. Where are you brain? Remember the part of the brain that's under construction, the prefrontal cortex. Considering consequences, empathy. When I use an iMessage, I'm literally teaching empathy. I have a problem. I feel because I'm literally saying when you do this, this is how it impacts my feelings. And this is why I'm literally creating goggles for them to see how does my behavior impact another person. Now they need to hear it over and over and over again. Of course they do because they're kids. <laughs> Grownups need to hear it over and over and over again sometimes too. But oh my goodness, it's clear. And I'm literally teaching empathy and self-awareness. When you do this, it makes me feel because I would like you to do this. And we can go straight to firm reminders. Clean up now. Time for cleanup now because I've already reminded them. Now, guess what? If you have done enough reminding already, I can move straight to consequences. Now, I'll also throw this other thing in there. And there'll be an email that I send out that Aaron will forward on to you that has the presentation, but also has a bunch of links to different, you know, videos and different handouts and things like that to use. You know, another really valuable tool that you can use if it's a 
chronic problem. You know, like for me, the problem of kids walking in the door and just dumping their stuff on the floor, you know, stuff like that. When when it keeps happening enough and, and nothing seems to be catching everyone's, let's just sit down and we're going to have a family meeting about this. All right, guys, we're going to have a family meeting about people dumping their stuff. So let's talk about this. What's going on? What makes it hard for you guys to hang your stuff up and put your shoes away? You tell me. And it's not like uh, interrogating, you know, what's going on with this? And they were like, well, we're just so tired and I don't really think about it or whatever it might be. Okay, so then I will use that iMessage. Well, I have a problem with you all dumping your stuff right when you walk in the door. I feel flustered because when I come home, all I see is a mess and it makes me feel like I have to keep on working. I would like you to hang your backpacks on the hook and put your shoes where they go. Will you do that? And we talk about this and what will happen if we don't do this. We're like not in the middle of a conflict and we're actually getting ahead of it. It's almost like a staff meeting for the family. And you can bring up anything you want at family meetings. Don't keep them too long. But kids can bring up stuff too. We had family meetings about jumping on the trampoline and people getting hurt. We had family meetings about what are our guidelines for using video games after school. We had family meetings about all sorts of different things where it was a moment where we could clearly communicate expectations through iMessages and good communication. And then the kids were actively participating in the plan too. I was. They were just as likely to follow a plan that they had some input in. And what if this doesn't listen? Okay, well, we can move to logical consequences. But I want you to see this idea about iMessages too and how powerful they can be. Here's what we often do. We'll say things like, you're a slob. And it could be 100% true. And here's what that doesn't do. When I walk in and I tell my 21-year-old who is now an absolute, oh my gosh, his apartment is like, holy smokes, where were you all my life? I mean, I found dried up pizza in his sock drawer. I mean, I don't even know what the thought process was for that would be a good place to put a piece of pizza. No idea what this preteen boy was thinking. Um, but if I walk in and I'm like, oh, you are such a slob. Here's what that doesn't do. Mother, you are so right. Hmm. I see paper plates and pizza and yeah, my bed's not made. My underwear and stuff is all over the floor. You're right. I really should clean this up. It would make me feel better and you too doesn't create any kind of a thought process like that. Someone insults me, all my defenses are up because I'm going to insult you back. No, I'm not. How rude, you know. Now, if I say I have a problem with you leaving your clothes on the floor, I feel frustrated because of the mess it makes and how clothes don't get washed. I would like you to put them in the hamper. Will you do that? When will you do that? That creates an environment that they might follow through. Now, if they don't follow through, then we can have a consequence. Did you know you can use iMessages with your sweetheart too? If I go and tell my husband, you are a slob. Well, actually, he would maybe tell me that. Um, I have a problem with you leaving your clothes. You know, if I say it like this to him or he says it like this to me, I can receive that much more than an insult. You are never on time. You are always late. You are the worst communicator. If, if that's how I'm communicating, you know, that does not bring about changed behavior. Get out those video games. You're so lazy. Versus, I have a problem with you playing video games instead of finishing your chores or homework. I feel frustrated because you're playing before taking care of your responsibilities and leaving the family extra work. I would like you to finish all your homework and all your chores before playing any video games. Will you do that? That is a clearer way of communicating. So this is step one. Guys, if step, step one works, awesome. Does it work every time? Of course not, because kids are kids, all right? So then if we move on to consequences, it's very important to try to create scenarios where they get to experience consequences that are connected to the misbehavior. Sometimes that can be natural consequences. These are just things that naturally occur from a, a, an action without a parent doing anything about it. I remember one time my middle son who really struggled with anger, he got so mad during an Xbox game that he threw his controller and his controller broke. And he came downstairs and he was so upset. He's like, mom, I broke my controller. I'm like, oh no, what happened? Well, I got really mad. This stupid game was cheating. You know, it made me lose and I threw it and now I broke my controller. I'm like, I'm really sorry to hear that. Can you take me to GameStop? Sure. Do you have the money for another controller? Well, no. Can you just take me and get one? I'm sorry, I can't do that. Um, however, I will take you when you have the money for one. Absolutely, I'll be right there with you. He created a natural consequence. Now, 
Half the time, do you want to go and break their controller? Yeah, go get a hammer and crack it. Of course you do, because you're human and you're sick of these video games. But when there was a natural consequence for him expressing his anger in an aggressive way, well, then he didn't get to have a controller for a while. And he sold some of his little stuff and had his little garage sale and used his birthday money. But, you know, stuff like that is really powerful for them to experience the natural consequences. You break it if you're playing rough with it. You leave your bike out and it gets stolen. Now, I don't love all those consequences, but sometimes they're the best teachers unless we switch the lecture on. A natural consequence, if I respond with empathy, they can see it. If he broke his controls, I'm like, what were you doing that for? I've told you to watch your temper. You are so ridiculous with your anger. All of a sudden, the focus would be off his choice to throw it and would be on me, the mean mommy who kills all things that are fun. Hey, if I respond with empathy, man, you really like that controller. The consequence does the teaching. No need for lecture. Now, a lot of times you can't use natural consequences. It's too dangerous. They're too far in the future or actually the consequence, someone else is paying the consequence. They're breaking someone else's stuff or something like that. So then when you, you want to use logical consequences where I find consequences where the discipline is logically connected to the misbehavior. And the best way to form these is with an either or or when then choice. So for example, let's say your kid is constantly leaving her bike in the driveway and it blocks you from pulling into the garage. I can go tell them and use an eye message. I have a problem with you leaving the bike in the driveway because I feel frustrated because I have to get out of the car and move it before I can park the car. I would like you to put it in the driveway, in, in the garage be when you're finished with it. Will you do that? Now, what if they don't do that? Then you can say, okay, either you put the bike away without me, without me telling you to, or I'm going to have to lock up the bike for a few days. Does that logically connect it? Absolutely. Now, when they forget to put their bike away, which you know they're going to do, and you lock it up for three days, when they come in and they're crying and they're all this and they're all that, don't be like, you know why your bike is messed. You know why it's locked up because I'm sick and tired of reminding you. I've just taken the spotlight from their choice and now I've moved it onto me, the mean mommy who doesn't understand. She's so mean. Now, when they come in and they're like, mom, I'm so sorry. I didn't, I, I didn't forgot to put the bike away. Can you, I please have it? I'm about to go over to my friend's house. I know you really love that bike. It's all right. You'll get it back in a few days. Respond with empathy. They know why the bike's locked up. You don't have to explain it or rub their nose in it. Oh gosh, it's so satisfying when we rub their noses in it. It's so human to want to do that, but that doesn't help them. If I let them experience the consequences of their choices and create logical consequences to help with that lesson, let the lesson do the teaching. And if that consequence isn't, isn't getting their attention, come up with a different consequence. So there's also the when then consequence. Yet when you do this, then you can do that. It basically puts what needs to be done, the obligation before what wants to be done. And the consequences, they don't get to do what they want to do until they do what they need to do. There's a really cool leadership curriculum for kids called Leader in Me. And in it, they talk about put first things first. It's based on Stephen Covey's um, Seven Habits of Highly Effective People. And there's several schools like East Elementary, where Aaron used to work, they have uh, the Seven Habits of Highly Effective Kids. And um, in that, you know, first things first is when I do my have tos, then I get to do my want tos. I'm going to put my, you know, important things first, and then I'm going to do my want tos. So teaching kids and creating these scenarios where they don't just get to do what they want to do, they do things that need to be done, then that becomes their normal. And you know what? Then when they're an adult, well, they're used to putting this stuff away before they go out with their friends. You know, that was the biggest surprise for me is my oldest son, uh, my youngest son, Colby, when he went off and got his own place. I mean, it was wonderful, you know, because he had had practice. All right, you got to do this before you go out and do that. Plus, on top of it, he just, he owned it. It's his stuff. And there was a sense of pride in that. Now, what about when you can't find a logical consequence? Because sometimes it's really difficult. There is one from Parenting with Love and Logic that I absolutely adore. And this is one I've used all the time. And I've even used it at school. When a kid drains my energy, you know, they owe me time. Man, it just took me 15 minutes because you didn't want to, you know, have self-control and you were screaming and kicking. All right, I'm going to need you for 15 minutes. I've got some organizing to do. And they come and it's time for time, baby. And I have them do things like organize my markers or, you know, wipe down my counters or something like that. And what's interesting is it 
gives them a chance to actually kind of feel like they're balancing the scales again. And while they're doing it, I'm not yelling and screaming at them. It's just like, oh, thanks. That's really helpful. They actually get to feel good while they're doing it. But hey, you took my energy. You got to give me some energy back. So it's the idea behind it is misbehavior drains my energy. Listening to sibling arguing drains my energy. Getting a phone call from the school about a misbehavior drains my energy. Having to repeat myself drains my energy. And now I create an opportunity for them to put energy back. So let me show you. And this, there's going to be some videos about this that I'm going to share with you because it's a little like, oh, that doesn't really make sense. Um, so I have some videos that kind of explain it and as well as some handouts and things. But here's kind of the, um, the gist of it. So you start off with empathy. This is so sad. And then you notify them of the misbehavior that's draining your energy. When you lie to me, it drains the energy right out of me. And then ask how they're going to do, put energy back. Oh, sweetie, this is so sad. When you lie to me, it really drains the energy right out of me. How are you planning on putting that energy back? Well, maybe they've got an idea about how they're going to put the energy back. Or maybe you create an idea. So some kids, they can do your chores. Um, when kids are fighting, man, it really drains my energy when I listen to you irritating your little sister on purpose. You know what? I'm going to have you do her chores tonight. That'll give her some energy back. Now there's a cost. You know, it's really satisfying picking on your little sister and hearing her squeal. You know, it's not so satisfying doing your sister's chores because you chose to pick on her. Let there be a cost to it. Um, thanks. And then you can literally thank them for that. Thanks so much. That was really helpful. I want them to feel good about putting energy back. I want them to feel good about relationship repair. But it's not, I'm not just making them feel good. They are earning that. They are, you took my energy, now give me some energy back. What if you don't have any ideas on what that could be? Dun, da, da, da. I have some cards for you. So this is 10 pages of four cards per page that are things that you can do. All right. So for example, um, clean all the sinks, gently scrub the sinks using sponge and cleanser, rinse and dry well. It literally tells them what to do. Clean the bathtub in the sink, organize the garage, rake and bag leaves, vacuum the kitchen floor, vacuum the couch, vacuum the car, sweep the garage. For some of my early childhood ones, um, you know, sometimes parents will create things that make that can give energy back. I had one mom that I worked with with her four year old and he would have to go out and squish bugs off the plants in their garden. That would give mommy energy. He would have to do things like move, you know, the, the laundry um, from the dryer to the basket. You know, she would create these extra things that he would need to do that are, sometimes he would go to bed half an hour early because that was going to give mommy some energy. Or sometimes if he wanted to go somewhere, mommy would say, man, you just drained the energy out of me this week with all the arguing and stuff. So I really don't have the energy to take you to the park. Maybe tomorrow if, if you know, I have some more energy. You know, you create a cost for them. But this could be a really good potential thing where they can do some of these chores and that gives you energy back. I had one mom, that same mom, she actually created a poster. And on the poster, she listed all these kinds of things that her young son could do. And that poster would change over the years as he got older, where, man, you when you, you know, argue with me, that really drains mommy's energy. So I'm going to need you to go pick two things off the chart to give mommy energy back. She even worked in choice. He got to pick what things and any of the thing, those things worked. Now, eventually, because he was so smart, he figured out that if he put go to bed half an hour early, he could make that work for him. So she calls me up one day and she's like, well, he's scheduled to go to bed at 11 a.m. on Saturday because he had picked that so many times. And so he was scheduled to go to bed. I'm like, well, just remove that option. If he's using it as a loophole and thinking, ha, 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 I tricked my foolish parents, then that's no longer an option do something else. So what's interesting is he is a in high school now, that kid can cook. I mean, like he actually has his own garden that he organizes. He's an amazing young man. And when she got out of power struggles and got into the energy drain and logical consequences, he actually learned skills along the way. And he loves to cook. Whereas before he was having to help with some of those things to give mommy some energy. Um, so these can be some great opportunities that can be a great consequence when it's hard to come up with an actual logical consequence. So, um, so you know, those are some thoughts about those things. Let me see, I'm making sure I'm sharing the correct screen. Um, and so that um, 
I will email you the handout as well as, I mean, I'll email it to Erin and she will forward that on as well as um, some videos that kind of explain the gist behind it. So now beyond the energy drain and logical consequences, here are some guidelines for logical consequences. Ask the child to help decide the consequence. What do you think we should do in this situation? Dr. Sorrells calls that collaborative problem solving. Where if I'm the one creating all of it, depending on the age of the child, sometimes there's a resistance. I've got a kid that I've been working with at school in third grade. And, you know, you know what? There's just a real problem with you constantly blurting out and, you know, not listening to the teacher. What do you think is going on with that? And we talked about it. Well, what do you think just should happen if you did that? And I involved him in the problem solving process. Now, ultimately, who has the authority? You, the parent. You've got veto power. But getting them involved in the process, there's learning and thinking going on there. Put the consequence in the form of a choice, either or or when then. When I talk about it in that way, that creates more opportunity for them to participate versus that defensiveness. Try to make sure the consequence is logically connected to the misbehavior. Give choices you can live with. Keep your tone of voice firm and calm. Give the choice one time and then enforce it and expect testing from your teen or from your little kids and give them a chance to try again later. Even with little, little ones, you know, when you have put your toys away, then we can watch our show. You know, either you, you know, put your things away or mommy will put them away for you. You know, if they are not taking care of their stuff or, or whatever it is that they're doing, um, you can be using when, then, and either or choices, even with very, very little ones. And while they're little, you actually have the opportunity to pick them up and move them. We used the consequence when our kids were very little of having a pack and play. And if they were scratching, biting, screaming, you know, uh, uh, any of those things, uh oh, when you bite mommy, it drains her energy. You need to stay in here till we're ready to use our soft hands or our soft teeth. And they would throw a fit in the little pack and play. I know. And then I'd go get them in one or two minutes. Okay, let's try again. Oh, we're using scratchy hands, you know, when you're ready for soft hands, you know, kids can't even talk, but they can understand for every 10 words a child can say, they understand 50. The dog would even understand that. Oh, you're barking. Let's go kennel up. You know, I'm not telling you to put your child in a kennel, but the pack and play was kind of like a set space where my little ones could go where they couldn't hurt themselves and they couldn't hurt me. Um, and it was a very effective thing. And then we'd try again and we'd try again. Then we would do all sorts of training as well as having preventive pieces in place, like getting enough sleep and all those kinds of things. So consequences can be such amazing, powerful things. And kids don't love them. But here's what I found. Me as a kid, I didn't love them because they were always so harsh and they were they really hurt. My kids didn't love consequences, but because of how I communicated, it seemed fair to them. Now, were there moments of emotional dysregulation? It's not it's fair. I know it's pretty difficult. And if they continue to font, whine and complain and throw a fit, man, it really drains my energy when you're throwing a tantrum like that. Either you stop throwing a tantrum or you can find ways to give me my energy back. Create a cost to that. All right. Um, let's see what else we got. There's also, and like I kept saying, empathy is everything. When we respond with lecture, it just shifts the focus back onto and against us. Keep the focus on their choice. Respond with empathy. Makes all the difference in the world. Now, there are some one-liners because, you know, kids love to um, start arguments and everything. So this will also be something that I send to you. These, uh, let me find them over here. They're kind of hiding behind my Zoom things. One-liners that stop arguments. You're so mean. Probably so. Nice try. I bet it feels that way. Huh, that's not fair. Now I'm going to go do, well, what do you think you're going to do? I don't know. What do you think? Thanks for sharing that was the one I used all the time. You're so mean. Thanks for sharing that. Well, you know what they want is they want a reaction. If I don't give it to them, I, it just kind of falls flat. Um, I bet that's true. What do you think I think about that? I'm not sure how to react to that. I'll get back with you on that. And I use that one all the time. You know, I love you wherever you live. Fine, I'm running away. I'll love you wherever you live. You know, things like that can just shut down arguments and can be really helpful. Those are also from Parenting with Love and Logic. Um, so uh, other thoughts. So hold on. I'm already doing that. I'm sharing my screen. So I have to talk to myself because I'm old. Uh, let's see how we do it. 
oh goodness, I'm just a little bit over. All right, and I've already mentioned family meetings and there's one other tool that I would like to introduce you to, this idea of the FLAC method. When I'm communicating and correcting my child, they're gonna have big feelings about it. I can acknowledge those feelings. I can see you're really upset about this. However, I need you to talk to me in the same tone of voice that I'm using with you. Either you do that or, you know, and if there are other alternatives, would you like to, like today, I had little kids out there in the playground, they're really, really upset. You know, I said, oh, I can see you're really mad. However, we're not allowed to throw wood chips. Would you like to sit and play with me? Or would you like to hold my hand and go inside? You know, I created that alternative. I created that choice. Um, and then also let them know if they couldn't do that, then they could go inside with me and not get the chance to play. But I use the FLAC method a lot where I'm acknowledging those feelings while still setting limits, creating choice where I can and reminding them of what the consequence will be. So it's a lot of different things that I've thrown at you. But if you are okay with one more minute, I've got a quick, quick story to show you can come up with a consequence for anything. I have a friend that our sons met at the neighborhood pool and, you know, her son is probably the most stubborn child I've ever met in my life. Now, unbelievably amazing, but man, that kid knew how to test limits. And so she calls me once when he's in fifth grade and she's beside herself. She'd caught him peeing in the floor vents, like urinating in the floor vents because he could. There's a bathroom. But so what? He would just find these ways to just drive everybody crazy. So they had gotten in that power struggles and you're grounded. I'm taking this. I'm taking that. I'm, I'm going to get rid of your Wii. And he looked her in the face as a fifth grader and said, if you take away my Wii, I will never stop peeing in the vents. And that's when she called me. She was literally at her wit's end, as would I. Now, my response was, I'm not sure how to respond to that. Let me get back with you. And my thought was, how can I create a logical consequence for this behavior. And so I called her back and I said, how much does it cost to clean it? She's like, oh, at least 400, sometimes more, whatever I've been quoted. I said, well, how about this? What if you put it in the form of a choice? Hey, you know what? I can't watch you all the time. But if you choose to clean the floor vents, that's totally your choice. Then you will need to pay for the cleanup because the rest of us can't stand the smell. And that's not sanitary. So again, if you choose to clean, pee in the floor vents, you're going to need to pay for the cleanup. And I want you to know it's going to be at least $400. And I told her, I said, you know, he's going to pee in the floor vents. Of course he is. He loves it. So when he has the consequence of paying for it, don't yell, don't lecture, respond with empathy and just move on. Don't get sucked into an argument because that's just an exchange of power. Sure enough, he peed in the floor vents. And I said, when he does, just say, oh, well, this is really sad. Okay, I'm going to schedule the guy to come. So I'm, I'm going to need the money. But at the Oh, okay. Well, I can get the money that you have in the bank account, but you're still, it looks like you're about $175 short. What are we going to do? All right. Well, we can have a garage sale. You wind up having to sell off stuff, return stuff to GameStop at their reimbursement prices. There was a significant cost to him. And there were plenty of opportunities for arguing and struggle. And she used the energy drain if he wanted to blame her and all that. She just responded with empathy. Yeah, I know you really liked her stuff. She didn't remind him of why she was selling it. He already knew. If she had jumped into that wormhole, it would have just turned it into an argument and taken the focus off of his choice and onto her. Now, that was a success. Did he come up with plenty of other opportunities to challenge her? Absolutely. But her consistency and her really in all attempts, you know, trying to use logical consequences as a young man now, he is unbelievable. Self-starter, out-of-the-box thinker, all the things that drive you mad when they're little have turned out to be his superpower now that he's older. So hopefully that's never going to cover everything, but hopefully I've given you a few ideas of just different tools you can have in your toolbox and how to get creative with consequences, use that energy drain, watch how you're saying it, um, and maybe that can make a big difference in your parenting. All right, no guarantees, but hey, I know it could at least a little bit of difference, and I know it made a huge difference for me as a parent. And having confidence in what I was doing and why, and knowing this kind of parenting really does prepare them for adulthood. Because adulthood is a lot of choices and then the consequences that come with those choices. So that is all I have, Erin. Is there anything that you would want to add other than I do have, they do have upcoming events on their Oklahoma Family Network if you go to Oklahoma Family Network website and just look at upcoming events, there's all sorts of different things that they have upcoming, including what she mentioned as some of the summer series that they'll be doing. 
Thank you so much.